for tuning in. My name is Sarah Brando, Director of Nutrition at BioAccelerator, and this is all about the gut. So every month, our nutrition department is going to be taking you through a deep dive into a different nutrition or health topic to help you expand your cellular health and maintain better overall health. So we decided the most important place to start, of course, was the gut. So I'm going to share my screen now and take you through all of the latest evidence-based research and protocols on maintaining and achieving great gut health. So I'm sure throughout your life before you have heard the phrase, you are what you eat. And actually it should be more like you are what you feed your gut microbes. So our gut microbes or our microbiome, the bacteria in our gut, they can weigh more than four pounds and they are a major determinant of our overall risk of disease. So for most people, your microbiome is created within the first thousand days of your life. So whether you were breastfed, what your mother fed you as a small child, these things are very, very important. However, we have a lot of scientific research that is going to help individuals who want to change and improve their gut health as an adult. So even if maybe you didn't have the best start on your gut health journey, it doesn't mean that you can't turn it around. And we're here to help you with that today. So why is the gut so important? I mentioned disease risk, of course, but also immunity, our mood and our weight are actually all determined by the quality and diversity of our gut bacteria. So focusing on supporting these microbes is one of the most important aspects to maintain lasting health. You may have heard of something called the gut-brain axis. So this is a very, very, very important communication center in the body. These neurotransmitters and hormones known as the gut-brain axis actually send messages to the brain. So our bodies contain more than 10, time, 10 times as many bacterial cells than human cells. So we're actually 90% bacteria and only 10% human cells, which is really interesting. Uh, are they our cells or are we their, their body? <laughs> Very interesting to think about. Um, tens of trillions of these microorganisms live within us and we get to determine their quality and what they're made of and how they affect our life. Our microbiome health and disease risk are intrinsically linked, which is why we can use tools like gut bacteria analysis, which are extremely accurate to predict the likelihood of health-related diseases or obesity. So studies have shown that a healthy microbiome is linked to lower risk of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, anxiety, depression, IBS, Parkinson's, even allergies, seasonal allergies, and even pet allergies have been linked to gut health. So these things may run in your family, or you might think you're genetically predisposed, but actually if you have a good understanding of gut health and what to do to feed and nourish your microbiome, there's a lot that you can change despite your genetics. So very empowering. Diet is important for immunity. You probably have some friends that never seem to get sick no matter what, no matter what's going around, no matter if everyone else in their family or friend group is sick. And then you might have some friends on the other hand that are always getting sick. Every month, every couple months, they come down with something. So this is going to come down to their daily food and lifestyle choices because 70 to 80% of the cells that comprise our immune system, they live in the gut. So if you're somebody who's constantly getting sick, then this webinar is going to be especially helpful helpful for you. Type 1 and 2 diabetics and also any individuals with IBS or bowel disease, they tend to have one major thing in common, which is a lack of diversity in their gut microbes. So one of the most important determinants of health in the microbiome is not what particular strains you have. There isn't one strain over another. There's some that appear to be more protective, but the most protective thing is diversity, is the individuals that have the most different types of strains. And so this is important because when you have a big diversity, lots of different types, when your gut faces challenges like antibiotic use, temporary poor diet, periods of high stress, because stress impacts the gut, when you're not sleeping properly, if you encounter any infections, any viruses, any bacteria, anything where your body has to fight, if you get food poisoning, or even just the stress on your body of traveling, flights, changing time zones, maybe not sleeping enough, all of these things can affect your gut health. So the more diversity you have, the better off you are. These are the signs of an unhealthy or a healthy gut. So if you're looking at the left and you think, oh, I've got a lot of those, then you might not have 
the ideal diversity in your gut. If you have some of those things, some of the time, that does not mean that you're in poor gut health. Everybody is prone to some of these things. Sometimes fatigue, bloating, maybe some cravings, because that can be emotional too. These things are normal and they're part of being a human. But if you are looking at that list and you think, wow, oh, allergies, my weight's all over the place, eczema, acne, rosacea, my sleep habits are terrible, I'm always getting sick, I'm always bloated, gassy, heartburn, indigestion, then it is time to really, really take your gut health seriously so that you can live more like the list on the right, healthy gut, minimal bloating and gas, not many of these symptoms, and definitely not every single day. Also a good way to tell is your skin, what is your skin health like? Is your weight more or less pretty stable? Is your sleep cycle stable? Are your moods balanced as well? And your mental health, because that is a good indicator as well that your gut is very healthy. Diet and mental health, for all the reasons mentioned and more that we will talk about, are intrinsically linked. So healthy, balanced diets that support a diverse microbiome are therefore protective in different clinical studies against mental health-related conditions. So anxiety, depression, even excess rumination, going over unhealthy thoughts, let's say over and over and over again. Diet can actually play a role and help with that. So um, there's a really new field, relatively new field called nutritional psychiatry, which is very, very interesting. And this field of research focuses exclusively on how diet and gut health affects mood and mental health. Very, very important area of research. This is something if it interests you, maybe do a little bit more digging after and you can read some of the studies and see how far researchers have come. When somebody is prescribed antidepressants like SSRIs, the most common side effects are in the gut. So while these definitely help mitigate symptoms and they definitely play a role in many individuals recovery and treatment protocol, ultimately it's important to know before you go down that route with informed consent that this is not going to solve the root problem and may actually make it worse because it can create an imbalance in your microbiome. So just something to consider. Um, we need that two-way communication between the vagus nerve and the gut and brain. So studying this and understanding it deeper and how medications interact are very, very important so that patients can make an informed decision when deciding what to do for their mental health protocols. Maintaining healthy gut microbes is very, very important for numerous tasks in the body besides just your immune system. We need healthy gut microbes to extract the nutrients from the foods that we consume in order to have energy. Even cleansing toxins, fighting off viruses, bacteria, mold, pathogens, anything we're exposed to while creating serotonin. So serotonin you might know of as the happy hormone. It's an important mood boosting neurotransmitter. We need to have adequate levels to literally feel happy. So our diet actually affects our quality of life and how we perceive our life to be. It's also important for regulating essential mental processes. So your learning capabilities, your memory, your retention, how much you will retain, and of course your mood are all related to your gut health. 90 to 95% of the body's serotonin are manufactured in the gut. So this is going to affect your GI activity and also your mood, but serotonin plays more roles as well. If you look at this list, Overall feelings of well being, yes, but also enabling the brain cells and other nervous system cells to communicate with one another and to regulate our sleep and waking times. Also, regulating hunger, digestion, boosting our memory, controlling bowel movements and function, and healing wounds. And the way that serotonin heals wounds is very interesting. It actually is able to communicate with tiny arteries, instructing them to narrow, which forms blood clots. So very, very, very important. Many, many functions of serotonin. However, like anything, we need balance. You do not want too much. Too much serotonin leads to excessive nerve cell activity, low libido, osteoporosis, and serotonin syndrome. So how does somebody get too much serotonin? Because most people do not have enough that have any sort of gut imbalance. Too much serotonin typically just comes from medication. That's where uh, serotonin syndrome typically comes from. Um, so if you're on any medications, this is something to be very mindful of. Also, if you're somebody who is frequently nauseous, our bodies are hyper intelligent and the production of serotonin actually helps us to remove bad food or substances. Um, which is very important. However, if you're constantly eating food that are foods that are making you nauseous, then that's going to create too much serotonin release as well, which is an imbalance and is not good. But more or less, uh, people that have to worry about this, it's typically because of medications. 
On the flip side, more commonly throughout society, too little serotonin leads to depression, um, anxiety, even suicidal thoughts or behaviors, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorders, and um, dysregulated bodily functions, like some of the other things that we spoke about. Serotonin is important for your learning, your memory, your mood. So you're not going to be able to learn as effectively and function as effectively if you don't have enough serotonin. That can also be caused by certain medications. Ironically, and unfortunately, sometimes these medications are used to treat mental health disorders, poor diet, and of course, poor gut health. So some of these things we have some major control over, which is exciting and empowering. These are ways that you can increase serotonin that do not have anything to do with food. So it's not only the food, food is very, very important because it's what you're putting in your body all day long. It's what we're fueling ourselves with. But the other things you can do, meditation in clinical studies and laughter, they have been proven to increase serotonin. So take some time to meditate, do breath work, have mindfulness practices, and also be around people that make you laugh. Maybe watch TV, watch something funny that's going to make you laugh. Anything that you can do to uplift yourself a little bit. And even just smiling actually can make a difference. It can trick your brain into thinking you're happy. Physical activity is important too. At least 20 minutes a day of moderate intensity exercise. Having a strict daily routine. By strict, I don't mean exactly down to the minute, but really trying your very best to go to bed at the same time every night, get up at the same time every morning and eat your meals at the same time, which is important for hormone balancing as well. So your body doesn't always wonder when food's coming. Getting the sun is important and it's free. You do not need a lot of sun. And when I say go out in the sun, you do not need to bake at 2 p.m. in the middle of the day in a tropical climate. You just need about 15 minutes a day on face, chest, and forearms. Even in cold climates, that should be enough to maintain your vitamin D. The body also stores it throughout the winter. So that's important as well. Make sure you get adequate levels when you're able to. And getting the sun in your eyes in the morning is a great way to set up your circadian rhythm. So your body knows, hey, Let's go. Let's pump some healthy cortisol. Let's get ready for the day. Let's get ready to break down food, to be alert and to function. Next, short chain fatty acids. So these are cool. This is a relatively new area of research as well. It's a little bit more prevalent in animal studies currently, but basically the short chain fatty acids are produced by our gut bacteria when we break down fiber rich foods. So think plants, the cells in the colon use these short chain fatty acids as an energy source. Therefore, they're an important player in gut health. Over time, high levels of stress or a very poor diet, they can create intestinal permeability. So tiny little particles like undigested food. If you have permeability, little gaps in your gut lining, these tiny undigested particles can move more easily into your bloodstream. And this can lead to chronic inflammation and then numerous diseases. So the research in, um, in animals was done in mice and introducing the short chain fatty acids. So from fiber into the gut lining of mice, it was able to reduce stress and anxiety related behaviors. So the gut leakiness as it's called, but it's, it's more intestinal permeability would be more correct. Um, this can come from persistent stress or poor diet or, um, pharmaceutical use as well. So this is the study was done on mice. It doesn't mean it's going to have the exact same thing in humans, but we do see it's pretty clear individuals with a very diverse high fiber diet tend to have better gut health. So this is one mechanism why really, really good news about bad bacteria in our gut. We talk a lot about good bacteria and bad or pathogenic bacteria. The bad bacteria, these pathogenic ones need to be fed constantly, which is why you have cravings and you feel like you really need these foods, even if perhaps they're not the healthiest for you. These bad bacteria die off significantly quicker than the healthy ones. So what this means for you is that if you make a dietary change and you really stick with it, or if you know what you're doing, feel comfortable with it, and you have the support of your doctor and you want to embark on some fasting, these could be great strategies in order to change your gut health around very, very quickly. Your good bacteria will not die off if they are not fed nearly as quickly as the bad ones. So if you want to use a tool like a short fast or intermittent fasting to launch yourself into a healthier diet, then that is a great thing. However, I don't recommend any sort of fasting for prolonged periods of time, or if you're just going to go back to your same old lifestyle, because then you just put stress on your body and didn't really do a lot of good. It's very, very beneficial if you do it as a first step towards a healthier lifestyle and to change maybe your cravings and your gut bacteria composition to make things a little bit easier for you. If you are somebody who struggles with sleep issues, 
a lot of this can be related to the gut. So your gut bacteria actually follow your circadian rhythm, which is why getting up at the same time every night or going to bed at the same time every night, getting up at the same time every morning and trying to eat at the same times is very important. The human body thrives on consistency. So trying to reset your body's internal clock is going to make a difference in your gut bacteria. And of course, eating those fiber rich foods, this will help you maintain those serotonin levels that we talked about earlier. And that means that you will be sleepy at night instead of feeling wide awake and not able to sleep and tossing and turning. If you are somebody with sleep issues and you're trying to make some changes in your life, one of the best recommendations I can give is if you're laying in bed, counting the ceiling, you can't sleep, getting frustrated, get out of bed. So just get out of bed, have stimulus control, sit somewhere, don't get your phone, don't get a book, don't turn on the TV. You have to stay in the dark, but get out of bed and sit on a chair or the couch and do some deep breathing exercises, some meditation, something to calm you down so that you don't associate your bed with frustration because that can lead to more stress, which is bad for your gut bacteria and make it more difficult for you to sleep. So when those feelings arise for you, get out of bed, wait 15, maybe 20 minutes, go back to bed and try again. And you might in the beginning have to repeat this multiple times, but it might change your association with bed and with stress and frustration around sleep. And this is a very, very proven strategy in different sleep studies that should be able to help. Prioritizing sleep, as mentioned, is extremely important um, because those individuals who do not get enough sleep, it also affects their immune system as well, in addition to memory, retention, mood, cognitive function, and therefore increases disease risk, heart disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes. So a lot of these things you might notice, there's a lot of overlap, poor gut health, not enough sleep, risk of disease. So that's why full body wellness is an extreme priority to us at BioAccelerator. In addition to your treatments, we want to make sure that you also have the lifestyle tools in order to maintain very good cellular health for life. Hydration is a big part of the plan as well. Staying well hydrated is crucial because it eliminates toxins from the body. This is the cheapest, easiest way to detox. You drink a lot of water, you exercise and sweat it out, you pee it out. It is, it's the easiest detox on the planet. And also our cells need water to function properly. And so do our digestive systems. So make sure that you have enough water, you're drinking um at least half to 0.75 of a gallon a day, depending on whether you're a man or a woman, your activity level, but stay hydrated. Very, very important for your treatment and also for your brain function and your longevity. Stress affects the guts. This probably isn't a surprise to anyone, um, but high levels of stress are actually similar, similar to a high fat diet in terms of damage to the gut. So eating a diet really, really high in fats, especially animal fats, toxic inflammatory oils, these things have a very, very negative effect. So some stress management techniques that we spoke about, meditation, yoga, breath work. If you don't know what breath work is, you can just look up, um, Wim Hof has a good one on YouTube, Wim Hof 12 minute breath work. And that's a great way to start the day, flood your body with oxygen. And also it's a good mental health practice just for you. Anything that helps you slip into, um, more of a mindfulness state and out of that stressful sympathetic mode into peaceful parasympathetic mode, that's going to be good for the gut and for your digestion. You are what you eat, what you eat matters. So these are the foods that those pathogenic bacteria, the bad guys that we don't want to feed too much. They love these foods. So processed foods. These are also, if you watch my anti-inflammatory webinars, it's the same list. Imagine how that works. The most inflammatory foods also feed the worst gut bacteria. So see how it's all linked. It's all the same. Fried foods, trans fats, chips, cookies, processed meats being the worst of all processed foods. So think like hot dogs, sausages, deli meats. People often forget about deli meats. They don't think they're quite as bad, but they have a lot of preservatives and other unnatural ingredients. Added sugars, refined sugar, sweeteners, high fructose corn syrup is the one to watch out for. Animal products, they do feed pathogenic bacteria. It doesn't mean you can't have any of them. Not everything on this list is created equal, but it's very, very important to understand that eating mostly these foods, especially if they're coming from factory farm sources with antibiotics and hormones and steroids and all kinds of undesirable additives, that is not going to help you build good gut health. Margarine and vegetable oils as well. So if you're eating at restaurants, what are they cooking your food in? It might be important to ask. Can you bring your own oils if it's a small restaurant? Can you find one that uses better quality stuff? 
And also refined grains uh, also are bad bacteria, love them. So white bread, muffins, cakes, white rice, cornmeal, flour, these things are not the best for gut health, but of course not everything on this list is equal. Some are worse than others. I mentioned high fructose corn syrup. This is a very, very sneaky one because sometimes on the label, it'll just say fructose or glucose. And you might read it and think, oh, that's not so bad. That sounds like fruit. It's not fruit. If it was fruit, I can assure you the manufacturer would put date syrup or whatever fruit it came from. But high fructose corn syrup is extremely cheap. It's, it's a chemically derived substance from GMO corn and it's very, very addictive and it tastes delicious to people. So they can get addicted to it in processed foods, fast foods, things like that. So beware of this. Uh, this isn't a lot of fake table syrups, ketchups, like look at all of your condiments and salad dressings, see that kind of stuff. Next, we have oils and the gut. So certain oils that are higher in omega-3 fatty acids, they can be part of a healthy eating plan, but others, which are too high in omega-6, are going to increase your inflammation. So definitely avoid everything on the left. On the right, this list is pretty good. You still need to keep them in moderation. Um, so a first cold pressed olive oil, first cold pressed being the highest quality. You don't have to worry about contaminants mixing with cheaper oils. Um, avocado oil is good, but still think it's always better if you're making a salad or something to have the whole avocado. So not needing to um, use just the oil, but maybe mashing up the avocado as a creamy dressing with some herbs and spices and stuff. That's obviously better because you still have the fiber, the antioxidants, all that good kind of stuff. Um, the seed oils, flaxseed oil, sesame seed oil, grapeseed oil, these would be in tiny, 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 tiny amounts. They still have too much omega-6. They're still inflammatory. Tiny, tiny amounts you can get away with, unlike the ones on the left, which I recommend completely avoiding, but those are still not health-promoting foods. So in general, not a lot of oil, but go for a first cold-pressed olive oil or a camelina or an avocado. Exercise plays a very important role in gut health because it alters our microbiome and it helps good bacteria thrive while creating an environment where bad bacteria will not be able to thrive. Um, so certain conditions like inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's, colitis, food intolerances, insulin resistance, these things are um, linked to inflammation. No surprise there. So one of the key ways where exercise is believed to impact gut health positively is because it raises your core body temperature and reduces blood flow to the intestines, which is a very simple mechanism of action. It just creates more direct contact between these microbes and your immune cells. And that apparently has the potential to shift your microbial composition. So literally just having that direct contact makes a difference. So just raising your core body temperature, saunas and steam rooms are able to do this as well. When we exercise, these abdominal workouts specifically, we cannot spot treat fat. Everybody kind of knows that. If you have a little bit of belly fat, there's no way to work out and get rid of only the belly fat. Um, it'll be overall fat loss. But things like sit-ups, crunches, planking, these actually promote healthy digestion and they are supportive particularly to the gut. The best way to build your foundation of health and uh, <laughs> basically your gut health. So therefore great health in general is to just eat in a way that supports these microbes, avoid the most inflammatory processed foods from that list I read and eat more whole plant-based foods. Understanding as well, the role of different conditions and a relation to the gut. This is a new area of research that is going to need a lot more research, but there's many, many scientists that are starting treatment protocols for children with autism that focus on the gut, which gut health, gut dysbiosis is actually found to be a major contributor to their symptoms. Breastfeeding has been found to be protective against autism and clinicians are now recommending pre and probiotics as treatment protocols for autism, as well as diets that are higher in fiber and diverse foods. So these bacterial metabolites can breach the gut and therefore the blood brain barrier causing inflammation. And this impairment is associated with autism. So very, very cool. As we start to learn more about these different things that unfortunately are rising in prevalence, hopefully we get closer and closer to a treatment, but a really great place to start for any condition appears to be in the gut. 
glyphosate and the gut. So this topic is important because while the scientific debate around the safety of GMOs continues, one thing is very, very clear. Glyphosate, which is the main pesticide used in GMO farming, is very damaging to gut health. This is a popular herbicide that's used to kill certain plants and grasses, but also to ripen crops as well. The U.S., with only 4% of the world's population, uses 20% of the world's glyphosate. It's also called Roundup Ready. Um, these are the seeds that have glyphosate already in them. This has been in our food supply for about 22 years now. The main GMO crops, corn, soy, sugar beets, canola, alfalfa, um, those are actual GMOs, but also this pesticide is sprayed on a lot of foods that are not genetically modified. So wheat is the major, major one. Oats, barley, lentils, chickpeas, so think like legumes, sugar cane, sunflower seeds, seed oil crops. We don't really know when people ask about GMOs, are they good, are they bad? We don't know the long-term effects of actually genetically modifying a seed. That we will have to wait and see, but we do know the short-term effects and medium-term effects. And now we're seeing even with individuals who are spraying these crops, the longer term over decades effects is potential carcinogens, fertility issues from this pesticide. So very, very tragic, the number of lawsuits and stuff that have been unfolding over glyphosate, but hopefully we do finally see some changes in the food system. It won't be sold for home use anymore for killing weeds in the backyard, Roundup, but it'll still be in our food system unless there's a lot of pushback or unless we do our best to stop buying these crops that are genetically modified. A lot of them are fed to animals though as well. So if you are trying to cut back on your consumption of GMO foods, but you're buying factory farmed meat, those animals were probably raised on glyphosate laden foods like the corn, the soy, the wheat, easy fattening foods for them and also not their natural diet, which makes the meat from those animals inflammatory as well. We were told by scientists that glyphosate kills all plants um, except the, those that are engineered to tolerate it, but doesn't have an effect on humans because we don't have uh, the same e EPSP synthase. So this is in the cell wall of a plant. Humans don't have this. And we were told it doesn't make a difference. It can't affect us because we don't have this. However, our gut bacteria are what are sensitive to it, not our cells in particular. So they were kind of going at it wrong, trying to understand this and trying to justify how it wouldn't harm us because over half of the species of bacteria in our gut, which we need this diversity, are very sensitive to glyphosate and therefore gut dysbiosis can come from somebody consuming a diet with a lot of glyphosate in it. What is the deal with gluten? People ask me this one a lot. Why is gluten all of a sudden bad? Why are people intolerant to gluten? So gluten in wheat is a difficult protein to digest because of the high proline content. Um, this is also similar to casein in milk, which is damaging to gut health as well. It kind of has the same inflammatory response in the body. So between that, there's more gluten in, in wheat products now than there was in the past because of hybridization, changing the crops, trying to produce quicker and larger yields, but also glyphosate. Glyphosate is sprayed as a ripener on the wheat crop to, to ripen it quicker, to get better yields. And that is going to affect gut health. So most bread products, if they're not organic, are likely to be um, contaminated with gluten. Same with oats that don't say gluten-free or organic. Oats are naturally gluten-free, but they tend to be processed in the same facilities as wheat products. And then you get a lot of cross-contamination. So here's the fun part, the solutions. We talked a lot about what to avoid. Prebiotics. Everybody knows about probiotics, but what are prebiotics? These are numerous foods that the good bacteria in our gut love to feed off of. These are known as prebiotic foods. And if you eat them all the time, this is much more beneficial than supplementing with probiotics while ignoring these important food groups. Prebiotics are basically carbs that our body can't digest easily before they enter the lower digestive tract. So they enter and then they become food for our gut bacteria to munch on. The best way to get a bunch of prebiotics in your diet to feed your probiotics is to eat a wide variety of foods. 30 different plant-based foods per week, 30 different plants appears to be the magic number. That sounds like a lot to you. Just remember things like herbs and spices, you know, your Italian seasoning, which might have parsley, oregano, basil, something else, uh, thyme. There's four right there. 
And so just kind of build, try and have different fruit, try different types of vegetables, greens, and you should be able to achieve that number. I also love supplementing my diet with raw dehydrated green powders. And that is how I make sure that I'm definitely achieving at least 30 per week. Some weeks I get many more if I count all my raw dehydrated good stuff that you can't always get at the grocery store. These are the top prebiotic foods, leafy greens. That is one of the most important things to have in your diet. You can eat them in salads. You can steam them. You could add them to pasta, have like a, a little lettuce bed at the bottom or green smoothies, green juices as well, but they won't, they're great, but they're not going to give you the prebiotic benefits because the fiber has been removed, but smoothies will still give that, especially if you don't over pulverize all different green vegetables. So think like um, asparagus, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, jicama, which is, I'm in Mexico. It's very, very common to see those here. They're a root. They are brown on the outside, white on the inside. You can cut them into strips and eat them raw, kind of like carrots and dip. You can add jicama on there, or you can bake or roast them like fries. Artichokes, bananas, flax, garlic, onions, dandelion greens. So they're not just a weed. <laughs> dandelion greens, the leaves are really, really great for our gut bacteria, but don't go picking them somewhere off the side of the road or something where they might be sprayed with pesticides or, but you can buy them. Um, some farmers do grow them and you can get them at different organic or health food stores I've seen. Cacao, which is raw chocolate, not to be con. con not to be confused with cocoa powder. Cacao is totally different. Um, it is the raw unprocessed form. So it's a lot more beneficial. It has a lot more of those living enzymes. Different berries are great prebiotics. Barley, asparagus, apples, cognac root, legumes and oats, tomatoes, soybeans, and leeks. Make sure those soy meats are non-GMO though. These are now probiotic rich foods. So these you hear more about and they do have a benefit, but until kind of recently, researchers were a little bit unsure of what that benefit was, how exactly it worked, what the mechanism of action was. And it's actually very simple. It appears that these fermented foods just adhere to the mucous membranes of the gut and they outcompete pathogenic bacteria for space. Kind of seems like... <laughs> That's what they do. And it's very, very simple, but it's very, very important. So you only need to consume small amounts of these every single day. Just think a little bit on the side of a cooked meal. Kombucha is on this list, but a lot of kombucha from the store isn't actually very beneficial. Most of it is going to have too much sugar or it's brewed a little bit too long. So if you know like a local kombucha maker in your hometown or at a little health food store where it doesn't taste sickly sweet and it's not super, super carbonated, that might be a good option. But things like kimchi, sauerkraut, miso, those might be um, better options where you don't have to worry about that if you're not sure. Pickled vegetables, the homemade type, but most of the pickles from the grocery store are on this list. They're overhyped. These things we're told are really good for our gut and probiotics are on this list. They're on the good and the bad list because a lot of store-bought conventional probiotics, the bacteria doesn't actually survive through the stomach and digestive tract to repopulate the gut. So um, some might work. And even still, if you're taking probiotics, that should be a short-term intervention. That shouldn't be something that you're taking regularly forever because if you're building good gut health, you shouldn't need to. And if you don't notice anything after a month of taking probiotics, then they're not working for you and you should try a different type or focus more on prebiotics, um, probiotic foods and diet diversity. Cheese and yogurts as well. They are fermented, but these are overhyped. They are inflammatory. Dairy products are inflammatory to humans. You don't want to be eating a lot of those, and you certainly don't want to be eating them with the intention of healing your gut. Sourdough bread, it is fermented, but still the yeast, uh, the gluten with glyphosate, these things are not great for gut health. Most store-bought kombuchas, as I mentioned, and mass-produced pickled foods like dill pickles from the grocery store. Not great. Things that are great, polyphenols. So this list is in order. So polyphenols are plant compounds that the gut loves. They're protective against different diseases and they're great for our digestion and our brain. So persimmons, if you know those fruit, they're little orange ones. They're kind of in season around the fall. Usually those are the top polyphenol containing food. This list goes in order. Then we've got artichokes, parsley, strawberries, Brussels sprouts, lychees, grapes, apricots, apples, shallots, which are tiny little onions, dates, and broccoli. Be sure to avoid antibiotic use unless absolutely necessary. 
Don't get this confused. I'm not telling you if you have a serious infection not to take antibiotics, but many individuals take them when it's not necessary, when perhaps the body's in the process of healing itself, or even when they have something like a virus where antibiotics cannot even play a role. Luckily, this has become more of an important topic in recent years and doctors have pulled back on prescribing, but many people would kind of go to their doctor's office and, and demand antibiotics because they had this idea that it would make them feel better. But for the average person, it can take six months to recover your gut health from a single course of antibiotics, three months for a very healthy person, two to three months, and up to a year for somebody who already has very poor gut health. However, if you do need to take antibiotics, doing all the things we talked about, eating the foods rich in polyphenols, the prebiotics, the probiotics, avoiding damaging things like alcohol, which is in here, that is going to help you have that diversity in your gut bacteria so that you are less affected. Alcohol can impair our ability to fight off illness and infection. It diminishes our white blood cells ability to battle pathogens as they enter our body. And also alcohol can disrupt the important balance of good and bad bacteria in the gut. Gut supporting protein sources. Most of these are going to be plant-based. You want to have a lot of different plant-based proteins. A lot of these are on the prebiotic list, as you can see. Even tempeh. Tempeh is a type of fermented soybean. So many people um, find that they digest that better and they think it's more delicious. Small amounts of animal products, being very mindful where they come from. Is your salmon raised in a farm or was it wild caught, wild Alaskan, which would be a better quality? What about the meat you're eating? Is it grass? fed and finished because some grass fed is kind of a marketing ploy where they have access to grass, but mostly they're eating GMO corn and soy. This is when local farmers and doing your research is going to be very, very important. So sourcing, understanding where your food is coming from, maybe eating a lot less animal products and spending that money on getting the best quality when you do eat them is a strategy to consider to improve your gut health, to reduce the amount of drugs, hormones, steroids that are coming in from animal products, and also to introduce more plant proteins and have that diversity in your diet. So in summary, these are the top gut health tips. We have 30 varieties of plants per week that we would like you to eat consuming both pre and probiotic foods with even more of an emphasis on those prebiotics, eating some polyphenols daily. Luckily, a lot of those foods are also on the pre and probiotic list and they're also plants. So see how these things overlap. And then of course, avoiding unnecessary use of antibiotics, drinking too much and eating a lot of processed foods. We are here to support you on this journey. I hope that this webinar was helpful. And if you have any questions about our lifestyle plan, please reach out. You can also book your consultation with me. If you are a patient, we get to meet twice. So make sure you book your personalized consultation so we can tweak any of these suggestions for you, for your lifestyle, for your preferences, and for your treatment. I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much, everybody who is watching this. Please leave any comments that you would like answered and I will come back and answer them later. So thank you so much for attending and have a great day.